In women, I think about estrogen as being like this, this shield that protects women from a lot of the things that men start to develop earlier. You know, men will get cardiovascular disease a good 10 years before women do. But as soon as we lose the estrogen, unless you replace it, like with hormone therapy, then all of a sudden, all those things that affected men now really start to affect women. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. Amy Killen. Dr. Amy is one of the world's leading experts in anti-aging therapies, such as peptides, stem cells, hormone replacement therapy, and much more. But do you want to slow down aging? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. Amy, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. And uh, I think, you know, we, we had a podcast, I think maybe like two years ago or something. And a lot of things have happened since that as well. But uh, the reason I wanted to have you back on was that I had a tweet recently where I was uh, listing like all these different organs that age very rapidly, like the heart and the pancreas and all the kidneys and stuff like that. And you were very wise to point out that uh, actually the ovaries of uh, women is actually one of the most rapidly aging organs of them all. And uh, yeah, you're completely right about that. And uh, I think it's I think it's like a good place to start in terms of like, why do women have, you know, the um, rapidly aging, or yeah, why do the ovaries age <laughs> so rapidly? Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, the million dollar question, or probably the trillion dollar question. We don't know exactly why the ovaries age so fast, but they, they tend to age about two to five times faster than any other organ systems in our body, which is why by the time you're 50, for the most part, you know, the, or the ovaries have failed and you're out of eggs and you're not making any more hormones. And that's, you know, that's when you go into menopause, but that process starts a good 10 or 15 years before that. And what's interesting about it is that, um, that the, every month, you know, we know that the, the ovaries will release an egg and obviously you ovulate, but what happens is also it's releasing about 500 more eggs during that cycle, um, that, that, that don't become the egg that ovulates. So they just kind of get partially follicles get partially developed. And then they go through what any other cells in your body would, they either go through like apoptosis where they just die or they go and become like senolytic that, you know, become senescent cells. And so the, the process of those follicles kind of dying off is very similar similar to the process of other cells in our body dying off. So there's some um, research that shows that we may be able to uh, slow that process down by using some of the same kinds of therapies we use, you know, elsewhere in the body for longevity. At what age does it usually happen? Like, is it at a menopause or uh, does it depend on like the individual, like uh, their lifestyle or something like that? Well, we don't know for sure. I mean, certainly lifestyle plays, you know, plays into it. We know that like smokers, for instance, tend to have, they tend to go into uh, menopause or have premature ovarian aging faster than non-smokers. Um, being over, uh, being very obese or overweight can also uh, predispose you to going into menopause early. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, lot, there's a lot of hormones and things involved and it hasn't been you know, it hasn't been researched, which is, which is really sad because, you know, half the population uh, on earth are females. And really until the last couple of years, no one's even thought to say, Hey, is there a way that we can actually delay these ovaries from aging? Um, and I think it's important, not just for fertility's sake, but also because we know that when you go, th- when you go into menopause, then you stop making, you know, key hormones like estrogen and, and progesterone for the most part. And that's going to then rapidly accelerate the rate of aging everywhere else in the body. So the ovaries are kind of like the, the pacemakers of the body. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of telling your body how quickly to age if you're a female. And so, um, and so lifestyle plays into it that we there's been some animal studies using supplements like NMN or other NAD precursors, melatonin, um, antioxidants like curcumin, resveratrol has been studied, um, metformin and rapamycin as well, the drugs. And all of those in animals have shown that they may, may have some benefit on delaying ovarian aging, but it hasn't been uh, investigated in humans yet. Mm, that's interesting. And especially like uh, given the fact that women on average like still live like maybe like five to 10 years longer than men do. <laughs> and uh, right. But their body is like, I guess, yeah, like there's a difference between like this vitality and like health span or just the youthfulness uh, and actual like lifespan or life, life expectancy. Yeah. It's kind of, I, I think about in women, I think about estrogen as being like this, this shield that protects women from a lot of the things that men 
start to develop earlier. You know, men will get cardiovascular disease a good 10 years before women do heart mm-hmm. attacks, strokes, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, and estrogen is, is kind of like this protective shield that helps protect us from some of those things. But as soon as we lose the estrogen, unless you replace it, like with hormone therapy, then all of a sudden that the, all those things that affected men now really start to affect women. But yeah, I mean, imagine we could live even longer and be healthier for longer, which I think is, is the goal for all of us. Mm. Yeah. Um, but what about men? Like, do they have any, yeah. Like what, what is the one that ages in men? Like, uh, anything specific? Well, I mean, testosterone certainly plays a role. It's not the, quite the same, but it does have some of some of the same benefits. And so we know that men who have lower testosterone, you know, in the therapy, if you're like the, like less than normal or less than, um, that, that normal range, then you have a significant increase in risk of everything from diabetes to heart disease and heart attacks to obesity. Um, dementia is probably going to be in there as well. So it's not exactly the same as estrogen, but it's similar. Um, but the difference is that in men, testosterone tends to drop fairly slowly, you know, over like over your lifetime, starting at age 40 or so, about 1% per year, it goes down. Whereas in women, that that estrogen just kind of plummets at, you know, somewhere around the age 50. And so it's a little bit different dynamic, but but testosterone is very protective for men. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, like low testosterone, yeah, like increases the risk of uh, just, you know, premature aging and uh, heart heart disease and all those things as well. So it's, uh, you don't want to be like low hormones, either, either yeah. of them. Like you don't want to be low, low with testosterone. And you don't want to be low uh, estrogen either. But in, <laughs> but this is another like very interesting thing because I I, I stumbled upon this like study where like these uh, eunuchs, so like um, like the men who have been castrated, they actually have like about almost like ten years longer life expectancy than normal men. <laughs> so yeah, it's another I, like I one of those rabbit too. holes. Or <laughs> I don't and I don't know why it's one of those things that's it's a very curious question. Um, I don't have any idea why. That is because to me that doesn't make any sense, but I have seen that as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there might be like, you know, yeah, testosterone has these health benefits um, in moderation, but if you have like let's say too high, because like you know, part of the reason why men might age or die sooner is also that their lifetime exposure to these androgens, and you know, they have a higher, they get like prostate cancer that women don't, and like the excess androgens probably maybe play a role there. Uh, so it's yeah, like probably like too high of like just the entire lifetime exposure of high to levels of testosterone probably have like some, you know, negative effect on like the premature death. It might. Although, and I also wonder if those studies are looking at things like um, non-health related causes of death. Like, I feel like a men, it, when, you, when you have higher testosterone, you're a little bit more prone to do stupid things, like to mm-hmm. take risks. And, mm-hmm. and so I wonder if part of that number is this, the men are doing things that are a little bit r- more risky, whether that's driving fast or, you know, bungee jumping or whatever. Like, I wonder if that's also part of that number, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. Just, I'm just making that up. Yeah, for sure. Like men usually have an unhealthier lifestyle and uh, they're more likely to smoke and more likely to drink alcohol and uh, all those things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, so, interesting. Guys. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so like, you know, what what can, uh, you know, besides pretty much, you know, stay, trying to stay healthy and, you know, eat a good uh, diet and eat or exercise and stuff like that. So like, what is some other, let's say, modern medicine, like interventions people can, you know, do? Because like, I mean, eventually that drop is going to happen anyway, like whether that menopause or this low testosterone happens in your 50s or 40s or 60s, uh, like it depends on your like probably some epigenetics and uh, lifestyle. But yeah, like once it happens, like eventually it's still gonna happen. So what can you like do uh, at that point? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for both men and women. I think that the, you know, back in, for women, especially there's been so much misinformation out in the last 20 years about, about hormones and replacement and, you know, relationship between estrogen and cancer or hormones and, and heart disease. Um, and this all really stemmed from the, this, there was a women's health initiative in 2005. That was a big study that was came out and basically the media reported it as, you know, taking extra estrogen causes breast cancer, and it also causes blood clots, strokes, and heart attacks. And that was released before the data was really looked at very closely. 
And so patients and doctors alike for the last 20 years, I mean, it's been 21 years since that study was released. Um, and there's been multiple looks since then that have shown that that's actually not the case, like that that's not actually what it showed. Um, in fact, that estrogen alone actually decreases your risk of breast cancer. Um, and then when you pair it with the, the synthetic progesterone or the progestin, um, then it increases your risk slightly, but none of us use those progestins anymore. We only use progesterone. So there's some things like that, that we're just essentially, because it's so nuanced, people haven't been able to like wrap their heads around it. And so everyone still believes that these hormones are dangerous, including many physicians, like including doctors, OBGYNs and, and urologists and people who, you know, should should, should know better. And so I think that that misinformation has been one of the worst things that have happened for women's health, because a lot of women are scared to take hormones. Um, mm -hmm. It's not quite the same for men's health. I think that testosterone has become um, testosterone therapy or other ways of increasing testosterone, like clomiphene or things like that have become um, much more widely accepted by, by both patients and physicians. Um, but it, we haven't quite gotten there for women's health yet. Mm, yeah. I guess, yeah, it's interesting because like it's a bioidentical hormone or like it's very, I mean, it's your body already has it. And uh, I guess it's like, it, I, I would expect actually like the men men's testosterone um, to have more of an association with negative side effects because like bodybuilders or like whatever athletes who like take steroids and um, like large amounts of testosterone, I would, I would expect that to have like a bigger negative association, but it's interesting that the estrogen actually has that. Yeah. Yeah. And totally, you know, certainly bodybuilders are taking either, either very high doses of testosterone or more, more often are taking other synthetic steroids. And those are, you know, those are obviously not going to be great for you. Like that's going to affect, um, potentially affect your lipids. It makes your HDL go way low, which is not, which is not good. Um, it can affect your liver function tests. Like there's a lot of bad side effects. It, it can increase your blood count. So your blood becomes very viscous. Like you have high red blood cells. Um, and all of those are bad things. Um, I think that the, that the notion that prostate, uh, prostate cancer is caused by testosterone is also what, you know, has also been a misinformation that has kind of gotten out and has been a little bit hard to get control of, but it hasn't seemed to have, have affected most men and their willingness to take testosterone the same way that I see it, you know, the estrogen myth uh, affecting women. Mm. Yeah, like I've also noticed that over the past, um, maybe like a few years, like a lot of people online have just started to even like pretty young at a, at a pretty young age, like they're starting to take uh, TRT at a pretty young age, almost in, in their like 30s or 20s, even some people, of course, if yeah. you have like a medical condition of hypogonadalism, then yeah, like it makes sense to or it's better to take like a medically prescribed TRT, but a lot of them might like jump the ship too soon or uh, or they might take, I mean, it's very interesting to see, like, you have these fitness <laughs> pages who are like, you know, super jacked and super ripped and they lift exercise, lift a lot of weights and stuff. And then they say, I'm on medical TRT <laughs> as a, just right. a, like an almost excuse to take steroids to build yeah. the physique that they have. So uh, like what age <laughs> do you think is like, uh, you know, when, when should men should start thinking about taking TRT or if they even like need to? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, unfortunately, we're seeing, you know, low testosterone has become much more common. We know that testosterone levels population wide have, have gone down um, by about 40% in the last um, 50 years. So we're seeing low testosterone more and more frequently, even in young guys, even in guys in their 20s. But what I tell patients is, you know, if you're in your 20s, your testes are still capable of making testosterone, usually. Um, so what we want to do is get that process happening where they're, where your own testes are making testosterone. Um, and so obviously, you know, starting with lifestyle is always is always best and starting with, you know, lifting heavy weights and getting out in the sun and, and moving your body more and cutting out sugar and decreasing stress and improving sleep and like all the basics, all of those things can affect testosterone. Um, and then in those, in younger guys, you know, younger than 45 or 50, if they still need extra help, then we will oftentimes look at doing medications like Clomid or Clomiphene or HCG, which will be, um, which will essentially like mimic this, the, um, signals that the brain is sending to the testes and telling your testes to make testosterone. So it's a way to increase your own production of testosterone. Um, and the benefits of those things when they work, which they don't always work, but when they work, the benefit is that, um, a, you don't have the testicular shrinking that you would, if you're taking testosterone therapy. <laughs> and the other benefit is that, you know, you don't, if you stop the medication, 
it's not like you're that you that you go that you regress and, and then your levels go back down again usually. Um, mm. And so, and you also don't have some of the fertility concerns that can happen when you take testosterone therapy, um, and you don't tend to get the the high blood counts either. So that's kind of a nice middle step, I think. It, it seems to be very safe. It's been used for years in that in kind of younger guys who need a little bit of extra. But then if that doesn't work, or if you're older than 45 or 50, then then TRT is not a bad choice. Mm, gotcha. And uh, as I understand, or correct me if I'm wrong, then like if you start taking it, like your nat natural testosterone does uh, decrease as like a compensation compensation mechanism. Uh, and and uh, like if you stop taking the uh, TRT or whatever testosterone you're taking, then you have to kind of you know, your, your baseline testosterone will be somewhat lower and you don't need to like reboot uh, the kind of production again. Yeah, that's usually what happens. Usually when you first stop taking TRT, um, your body's a little bit confused because it's had this, you know, it's had this high testosterone for a while that's basically told your testes not to make testosterone, right? Like you're, it's, there's so much in your body that your body's like, okay, well, we don't have to make it ourselves. It's already here. And so when you stop it, your levels will go back down again. Usually if you're young and healthy and you haven't been doing like high doses of um, like, you know, synthetic steroids, like bodybuilders, usually your, your testes will, will start working again within a couple of weeks to months and your level will go back up. Sometimes we'll use those medications like the Clomid or HCG for that little, that period of time to try to just kind of stimulate the, the testes to get started working again. And then we'll take the medications away. Um, so it's, you know, usually the, your testes will start working and it's not a problem, but if you've been using high doses, like really high doses of testosterone or other synthetic steroids, like bodybuilders, sometimes you kind of wreck the whole system. And it, and in those cases, I certainly see people who you can give them weeks or months or even years and their testes are like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing this. It's like the, all the hormones kind of get messed up. Yeah. And then you're like, at like a worse place than you were in the beginning. You're kind of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would definitely caution people, especially younger men, especially, you know, especially if, if fertility is important to you um, or just health is important to you. <laughs> I would really caution you about just injecting yourself with random, um, you know, random steroids that you, that you bought off the internet or got from the guy at the gym. Um, you really can mess up your body. And, um, and, you know, I'm saying that as someone who likes to experiment with things, but, but that's not the best one to experiment with. Mm, yeah, for sure. And, uh, think about like the, you know, why, why do you think you need it? Like, like those fitness people, they use it for the you know, fitness side of uh, being able to build some more muscle and burn fat. But uh, so some people might like, let's say beginners who are beginners at the gym, they might also like jump to, or they want to jump on some sort of a testosterone cycle immediately because they don't see the improve or the, they don't see the results that fast. So they're right. like, I want to get the muscles <laughs> super fast and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump on some sort of a steroid cycle and, uh, you know, fast track the kind of results. But, you know, it's very, Again, it's not permanent and uh, it actually might have like some down the line, some very negative side effects. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, you and I, I think, medical kind of. I think both of us kind of like um, to, you know, we like to embrace new technologies and potentially experiment with things and, you know, do some like biohacker stuff. And I think that there's, but there's a kind of a fine line between that and going overboard and actually potentially messing up your, the system as it is. Cause our system is so elegant, you know, it's so elegant and it's so perfect. Um, and if we mess it up, it really can kind of throw a wrench in things. Yeah. Yeah. I made a video maybe like, uh, yeah, yesterday or something uh, that outlining my plan of how do I, live, how do I plan to live until a hundred years old? <laughs> and of course I listed out all the fundamentals of the exercise, et cetera. And I put like, I'll start TRT probably if I'm like in my fifties or something, because at that point, like your natural testosterone levels is already pretty, you know, declining. And I think the quality of life and just the, like the improved health span effects are kind of worth it at that age. But, you know, if you don't yeah. really need it before that, then there's no, I, and I've heard like some myth that, or I don't know if it's a myth, but uh, I've heard some people say that if you, you know, that if you start too soon, then it stops working down the line or it ha it becomes less effective over time. So you need to kind of either up the dose or, or something. Or is, is there any like this kind of effect or you can start whenever and still have the same effects? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think that that's true, but I mean, whenever you start it, you'll all, you'll usually see this, this, you know, in the first few months, you'll have this like big uptick in energy and, you know, gym performance and mood. And like, you, you know, there's a big swing where you can really feel the effects. 
And then once you're kind of on a dose for a while, then those, you know, you still feel good, but you don't have that like that, like up, you know, it's not quite the same. So I think that that's more like that. Like you just kind of get used to where you are, but I do think that your plan to wait until you're in your fifties and you really need it. Cause you know, at some point the testes do kind of lose the ability to make testosterone. Um, just like the ovaries, you know, kind of peter out at, over time, the testes do that as well, just not quite the same way. Um, so at some point, then you actually do need additional testosterone, potentially, you know, some guys are in their eighties and still have high testosterone, but many, many people need some help along the way. If you really want to live, um, you know, pull out and do exercise and do all the things you want to do and stay healthy. Mm, yeah. Um, and what about women? Like, is there any I don't know, time timeline that you would besides like, you know, starting HRT after menopause, or is there like any do you ever see like any situation where starting it sooner or yeah. Um, so I tell people, women, you know, once you hit about 30 to start at least thinking about your hormones, and that just means maybe get a blood test. You know, I'm a big fan of blood tests. They're super easy. They're super cheap. They're validated results. I don't think you necessarily need to go and do all the other crazy mm -hmm. tests that are out there, but get a blood test, um, get some basic hormone levels and just see where you are. It doesn't mean you need to do anything about it. If your cycles are regular and you feel good, then you're probably fine. But as you get closer to 35 and 40, that's when we start seeing some of the perimenopausal shifts. Um, usually at that point, it's more that you have lower progesterone compared to estrogen. So you can get some symptoms like the, in the weeks before your period, you'll have, you know, things like cramping or fatigue or irritability, or you can't sleep or, you know, some of those things get worse during that, that time period. And then testosterone can also be low and that can happen really at any age. That's, that's made in a different area. Mostly the adrenals are making it, um, but testosterone can be low and that can affect, and, you know, just like in men, it can affect energy and motivation and libido and, you know, ability to burn fat and build muscle, um, brain health. Like there's all kinds of things that are tied to testosterone in both men and women. And a lot of women I see, especially things like if you're on birth control pills that can make your testosterone go down. Um, certainly other lifestyle factors, um, overtraining and things like that can do it. But then, and then in, in perimenopause and menopause, we also tend to see um, not everyone, but a lot of women will have low testosterone. So you can start those hormones, the progesterone and testosterone, especially, you know, earlier 30, 35. Um, and then, uh, then once you actually hit menopause, then you would take estrogen as well. Mm, okay. Gotcha. And uh, is there a way, but what about like, I, th I think like DHEA is also like uh some amounts like beneficial for women, right? Yeah. Yeah. DHEA actually, professor. and that one you can, it, in, in women, so DHEA is a supplement. It's over the counter. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to get. Um, I like it for both men and women, especially again, as you get closer to 40 and above, uh, it's good, good for a number of different things in women. DHEA can increase your testosterone levels a little bit as well. We mm. don't tend to see that in men because men's levels are going to be, you know, 10 times higher than women, but in women, DHEA can do it, which also means that you can have side effects from DHEA, um, more with women, but things like acne and breaking out and things like that, mm. just like you would see with testosterone, potentially you can get that. So I just tell women start low, like five or 10 milligrams a day is, is plenty um, until after menopause and you can go up versus the male dose is going to be more like 25 or even more depending on the person. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, like I, I think if you have low testosterone, then DHEA as a man could have like some maybe small benefits, but yeah, if you have like already normal or, or high testosterone levels then it probably hasn't no effect. Yeah, it may, you know, DHEA works, um, kind of in it's involved with cortisol and the cortisol path. And, you know, one of the reasons that men can have low testosterone is too much kind of chronically elevated cortisol levels, whether that's from lack of sleep or whether that's just from stress or whatever else. And so DHEA can help kind of modulate that a little bit. I don't think it causes, it doesn't cause an, a huge increase in testosterone, but it, it can kind of affect some of the other pathways that can help increase testosterone. Nice. Um, but is there a way to, for we, in the, in the context of women, like to postpone the menopause, um, like, uh, any, you know, besides being healthy and, uh, because my wife is like pretty interested in that she's like only 30, but, uh, of course there's something like most people think about, uh, like a lot, like when, when is there like the menopause starts? So how can you like postpone it as much as, uh, possible? <laughs> 
Well, that's, we don't know for sure. Um, and, but certainly I do think that starting early is, is a good, you know, starting at around 30 is a good idea. But if, if there's, if we knew what it was, and I'll tell you some potent, potential possibilities, but you'd want to start it early because by the time you actually get to menopause at that point, once you've run out of follicles or run out of the, the things that make your eggs, then you can't reverse that, right? Like we only have as many eggs as you have. So once you've released them all and they're gone or they're either dead or they've, you know, they've, they've left your body in some way, then you can't turn back that clock. So you kind of have to make sure that you're looking at it years earlier when you still have a lot of eggs and follicles. So um, I'll, I'll, I mentioned some of the things earlier, but I'll, I'll go through a little bit of it. Um, so the, probably the most exciting research, and there's actually a study that's, that is just launching for human women, um, they're recruiting right now, is, is rapamycin for mm -hmm. ovarian aging. Uh, and obviously you're familiar with it for just in general kind of longevity purposes, but there's um, a number of anecdotal report, of, of reports in women that you know have taken rapamycin in perimenopause pause or even an early menopause because early menopause you still have about a thousand eggs they're still there they're just you don't have as many in their kind of lower quality but women who have taken uh, rapamycin in those areas and have been able to kind of reverse and get back to having normal cycles um, has been reported but again just you know anecdotal stories but there is some animal research with rapamycin and metformin actually that shows that um, that it can help with fertility um, in in women. So, like in the animals, they would do um, rapamycin for a, a couple of cycles over the course of I don't know if it was weeks or months, but they would give the animals rapamycin um, in this like a kind of a number of cycles, and then they would stop. And they would do that when they're young, like you know the equivalent of women a twenty or thirty year old female, and then they would just stop, and then they would see how that affected fertility rates later on. And the animals that got the rapamycin had better fertility rates, better kind of quality of eggs, things like that than the ones who didn't. And um, the, the only thing is that when you're taking rapamycin, it, it's not the best time to get pregnant because, you know, it's basically inhibiting cell growth, right? Like it's, a, mm. it's an mTOR inhibitor. And so it's inhibiting cell growth. So it's the opposite of what you'd want for getting, for actual getting pregnant. So I just tell people, and again, this is all like, we don't know for sure. It's all conjecture. Talk to your doctor, not medical advice, all of that. But I just tell people, if you're going to experiment with rapamycin as a female, you just don't want to get pregnant, you know, while you're doing it. Like it's, you, however you do it, work with your doctor, but it, we, we do think it could potentially help with fertility and, you know, maybe ovarian aging. Mm. And you don't want to get like uh, infected or sick either because it's like suppresses the immune, immune system a little bit. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it does a little bit, but you know, actually there was some interesting research during, um, like early COVID that, uh, you know, that it, because we're taking such small doses, like the protocols for longevity are, are much different, obviously, than the protocols for, you know, for treating graft versus host disease or things like that, where you're, where you're really trying to suppress the immune system. It's basically like, a, you know, it's a little bitty baby suppression. And then, and then the immune system actually gets kicks back up and it, it acts even better sometimes. So there's the fear theor it's theoretical risk of increased infections, but I don't think that at the doses that are actually being taken, that's really a concern. Um, for most people, I think the biggest issue is the mouth sores, which I just have, I have one right now that's healing and it's so painful. So for some reason, we don't know why, um, rapamycin causes uh, canker sores in the mouth, um, sometimes, and that's the worst side effect <laughs> that I have, that I've seen with it. Mm. Yeah, I had uh, Matt Caberlan on my podcast as well a few weeks ago, and uh, yeah, he also talked that the, that was yeah. the, like the biggest, biggest uh, side effect. And yeah. the, he also does like a dog study on rapamycin, which is actually very interesting. And uh, this is like a stupid question, but like, do dogs also have menopause or... <laughs> You know, I don't, I believe that the only, and this is actually not a stupid question. It's a good question. Um, and also my dogs are on rapamycin as well. They have been for a few years. Um, but the, <laughs> the only animals, the only mammals that we know of that ha that go through menopause are humans. And then there's like several types of orcas, like whales right. that go through menopause, which I think is fascinating. So I don't think that the dogs do. I mean, basically all other mammals seem to not have this period where they just like their body just stops making these vital hormones, you know, halfway through their lives. And so with that in mind, it, you know, you just wonder like, why are we set up like this? Mm. Um, and maybe it's just a matter of like, you know, back hundreds of years ago, women weren't living, you know, much beyond 50 if they even made it to that age. Right. Like, so the, the body wasn't, it didn't really have to worry about well, what happens next. Um, but it's only been in the last um, few hundred years that we tended to live longer. So 
Uh, I don't know why it's there, but I actually think that we need to figure out a way to get rid of menopause or at least really delay it. And there's some people doing that research now at the Buck Institute and other people that I think, you know, at some point we'll make some headway, but it'll probably be five or 10 years, probably too late for me, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, maybe the like rapamycin or something has like some breakthroughs and some other technologies that also like extend the average lifespan so much that uh, you'll you'll be able to like reverse it or, or yeah who knows <laughs> yeah and, and you know there's stem, stem cells potentially could have some benefit as well um still you know again it's mostly animal studies that and you know people are doing stem cell injections into the ovaries like doctors i'm not doing them but other doctors like fertility doctors some of them do that for fertility and uh, i reportedly have some good success but i haven't seen any human studies on that. Um, but that's something else that, you know, down the line, especially as we develop better stem cell technologies, uh, I think that could have some benefit as well. Hmm. What about like having uh, children? So like, obviously, women can't have children after menopause. But like, does when you have the children uh, determine like the when, when you get menopause, like if you have children later, are you more likely to get the menopause later as well? Or um What's that? I don't, I don't think that there, I don't know of any correlation between that. And one question I also get a lot is if I take birth control pills, which of course prevent ovulation, will that help to delay menopause? Because you'd think, you know, you're running, you're not running out of, of many eggs. Um, but the answer is no, that doesn't affect um, when you go into menopause, because if you kind of remember, even if you're not getting, you're having that sort of ovulation every month, that the, you still have all the other follicles that are kind of partially developing and then dying and the, and the process is still partially happening. So birth control doesn't seem to affect a, um, age of menopause. You know, things like when did your mom go into menopause? That's very predictive. Genetics is a big part of it. Um, and then we think lifestyle is part of it. And then potentially there's another piece um, as well. Hmm. Yeah. So for men, they don't go through menopause, <laughs> but, uh, you know, m men can with age probably get like some aspects of uh, erectile dysfunction or I mean like men can get children probably uh, until the day they, 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 the day they die but uh, they usually older men you have like some aspects of uh, erectile dysfunction so like what what's the like uh, deal with that and how can they uh, prevent it yeah um, erectile dysfunction is pretty common unfortunately after the age of 40 um, about 40 percent of men will have some degree of ed after the age of 40 and and that of course is very much tied to to lifestyle and health um, you know I talk about sexual health to me is it's just this is a great marker of general health and including mental health emotional health you know spiritual health as well as obviously physical health um, and then social health relationship health and even environmental health like all the healths play into social to um, to sexual health. Um, but, but so ED is pretty common and there's a number of different causes. The most common types uh, of ED are related to blood flow. So vascular causes. And the most common type is, is, a, is something called a venous leak, which is, uh, or CBOD is the other name for it, which basically means that the, that the blood goes into the penis um, normally, but then it comes right back out, you know, it, it kind of leaks back out again. Um, mm -hmm. And that's actually a problem, not with the veins so much as the cells, the smooth muscle cells that are in the penis. Um, what happens is that with age or inflammation uh, or you know, disease processes um, associated with that, the smooth muscle cells get replaced by scar tissue or by fat. Mm. And that's, you know, that's definitely influenced by lifestyle. So that's, you know, everything from low testosterone can do it to being obese, to having diabetes, to not exercising, to having high, you know, high blood pressure, like all of those things, anything that causes kind of inflammation system wide can cause inflammation in those cells in the penis. They turn into either fat or scar tissue and they can't stretch as much. And so the blood comes in, but then you can't stretch as much and to close off the blank, the, the veins and the blood comes back out again. Um, mm. I could talk for days about, about ED, but the point of that is that, you know, the things that the decisions that we're making, you know, day to day, starting even in your thirties or even earlier, can have a direct effect on how well your penis is going to work, you know, in the next five, 10, 15 years. Mm. So like the bad, unhealthy lifestyle, like being obese, uh, diabetes probably, and uh, you know low testosterone, those things are, will uh, speed up the erectile dysfunction. Yes, absolutely. Smoking is a, is a is a huge one, and of course, I don't. I bet your audience doesn't smoke very much, but I always tell people I feel like you know how they put those that they in the U.S. they put the 
the uh, warnings on cigarettes that are like, you know, smoking may cause lung cancer or smoking may cause this. I feel like they should just put this a picture of like of a lymph penis. <laughs> 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 just yeah. saying, smoking will cause you your penis not to work and yeah. i really feel like we would see a, a marked decrease in the amount of smoking that's out there <laughs> yeah i think that's that's a bigger motivation for men than uh dying sooner <laughs> so. I, I think so too more than like telling them you're oh yeah you're, you're gonna have a heart attack and just tell them you you're gonna have erectile dysfunction yeah. and i think that they would stop smoking but nobody asked me <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and uh what what, what are some like ways to like you know you can exercise your muscles you can probably exercise or you, you can exercise your uh, penis muscles as well and like how do you mean because like the blood flow is there during an erection and i guess i guess like regular uh, blood flow to the penis is also important to maintain that like uh, that flow it is and and actually um you know aside from when you're having sex or when you're you know masturbating or whatever the other time that your your penis is getting good blood flow and good oxygenation which it needs is while you're sleeping at night so during REM sleep, you know, four to five cycles a night, you're having erections if you're healthy. And one of the one of the clues that you are maybe ha starting to have some problems is if you're if you're not waking up as much with erections. And yeah. obviously, it depends on when you wake up during your sleep cycle, whether it's REM or not. But if you're waking up during REM, um, you should have an erection. And so what I tell people is, you know, just kind of keep general track of that. And if it was, you know, if it was three mornings a week that you were having morning erections, and now it's one or zero, then that's a, that's a clue that something is going on and it could be testosterone. It could be vascular issues, blood flow. It could be, you know, it could be uh, nerves. It could be all different things, but it's, it's important that you not ignore it. Um, if that's happening, I recommend thinking about using penis pumps, like a vacuum pump, um, mm -hmm. during the day for 10 minutes or so, because that helps to keep the cells that we talked about in the penis healthy, because you're getting all that blood and oxygen in there. Um, but then also figure out why that's happening, why you're not having those erections. Mm. Can the penis pump also like cause damage? <laughs> like, uh, yes, <laughs> it can cause damage because when people do it like too aggressively, you know, a lot of guys are like, I'm going to go hard or go home. <laughs> like they're just like, Rah! and they'll just like, it, you know, if it hurts, you shouldn't do it. Like it, it might feel a little uncomfortable, but if it's hurting, you should, you should stop. Uh, and I think it's, it's not that easy to hurt yourself, but it certainly can happen, uh, just from not paying attention to your body. Mm, yeah. And is there like a workout stack for that? Like, you know, you take pre-workout before the gym <laughs> to get like a good pump and uh, better muscle, muscle like recruitment. Like, I, I guess you could take like the same, like citrulline or uh, beetroot and stuff like that. Before yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I think nitric oxide boosters are the way to go. And that's going to, that's going to be helpful, you know, just to have it as a, on a daily, you know, daily nitric oxide boosters. Yeah. Whether it's L arginine or L citrulline, that's good. Those are going to work better in younger guys. Once you get to be 40 or so, because the nitric oxide is going to be partially made in the blood vessels and partially made, you know, from food, um, the blood, the type that's made in the blood vessels, you have to have nice, clean blood vessel walls and good epithelial function. So the, the, the cells that line the blood vessels have to work really well to make nitric oxide um, in, from that from the L-arginine pathway. And so what happens, unfortunately, with aging, especially if you're not very healthy, then those you start to get endothelial dysfunction, which is the first step towards atherosclerosis and heart attacks and, and strokes. And so taking L-arginine in, if you're over 40 or 50 and you're not very healthy, especially doesn't actually work and actually can have some side effects. So, but I do like like beetroot, you know, powders, or there's certain products out there. Um, like Nathan Bryan's product is great. So there's some nitric oxide boosting products that can be helpful. Um, you know, no matter what age you are. Mm, gotcha. And, uh, what about, I think I remember the, there was a, like a Viagra study that, using Viagra was associated with reduced mortality and reduced uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, and, you know, probably, I don't know, the mechanism for that is probably because of the better blood flow and the nitric oxide, or what do you think? Yep, it totally is. So the way that Viagra and Cialis and all of those, those medications are called PDE5 inhibitors. And the way that they work is they prevent essentially in general, they prevent the breakdown of nitric oxide in your body so that the nitric oxide that you're making sticks around longer. So it's kind of like taking a nitric oxide booster, but it's just stronger and it, it lasts a little longer. Um, so yeah, those drugs were initially studied um, before they were studied for ED. They were studied for um, heart disease patients and patients who had pulmonary hypertension. So heart and lung patients 
um, were starting, you know, were, was when it was first studied. And then the drug companies realized that they were helping so much with, um, with ED that they pivoted and they became, you know, erectile dysfunction drugs. But there's still, there's, there's definitely still potential benefits. I think that, um, I think probably in the next five years or so, that those those medications will be considered uh, in that sort of longevity drug category. They already are by some people, but you know things like the rapamycin or carbos or some of the other things that are considered potential longevity drugs. I consider the PDE five inhibitors uh, to be in that category, like a low daily daily dose, and it's because of nitric oxide. Um, mm. So if you can get it from other, you know, if you can get your nitric oxide, nitric oxide from other sources, whether that's the sun or red light therapy or exercise or eating foods high in um, nitrates, green leafy vegetables, et cetera. Um, that's fantastic. But if you need more than those medications may be helpful. Yeah. 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 It's, I think like probably like in your eighties or for example, it's, I th I'm not sure like how many 80 year olds have like erections or stuff like that. But uh, yeah, like at that age, then just the nitric oxide boost, regardless if you have like the, if you already have uh, morning wood uh, without the PD, PD5 inhibitors, then uh, I think using that as the nitric oxide booster is still beneficial because like the ED is also a sign of, you know, the atherosclerosis and uh, right. that's, you know, you don't get the adequate blood flow to, you know, the regions, different regions of the blood body. Yeah. And I think the other lesson behind it is, you know, I have a lot of men who, um, who have some ED and they take they take, you know, Viagra or Cialis and it works for them when they take it, but they're scared of taking it because they think it's bad for them. And mm. what I try to tell them, you know, you can, you can have that opinion or certainly if it gives you, you know, it's going to, there are side effects, flushing and headaches and nausea and all those things that can happen. So if that happens, then, you know, maybe it's not for you, but if, if you don't have side effects, um, it's actually one of the drugs that I think are one of the few drugs that I think are not actually bad for you. Um, and that overall are probably more beneficial than not, and not just for ED. So I just tell people, you know, I think a low daily dose of like a Cialis, you know, five milligrams a day or something like Tadalafil, um, is actually not a bad regimen if you have ED because you're going to be helping with the ED, but then also potentially helping with other cardiac function, other things that require nitric oxide. Mm. What about like in the movies when uh, they take the Viagra and then they're like having the erection for like the rest of the day or two days in a row? Like is, is something like that possible or? That is possible. It's called priapism. Uh, it's possible. It doesn't happen all that often, but certainly if you have an erection that lasts more than four hours, then you should make sure that you talk to your doctor. You could actually take um, like a Sudafed uh, medic. I don't know if you have Sudafed, but basically it's a um, medication that helps with stuffy noses, like a decongestant. It's interesting because the tissue in your nose, the erectile tissue in your nose is similar to the erectile tissue in your penis. So if you think about your nose being congested and you take a decongestant, um, that actually can help if you happen to get priapism or the erection that won't go away. And on the reverse of that, if you're taking Sudafed or other decongestants because you have like allergies or you know congestion and you have a cold or whatever, and you're doing it for several several weeks or whatever, you'll you may actually notice erectile dysfunction because that say it's very similar tissue and you're essentially keeping the blood from staying in your penis. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about uh, what about women like uh, is there any like exercises or supplements that they can use to like i don't know how do you say it, like enhance the vag vaginal function or performance <laughs> well i mean you know blood flow is good for women also it's not you know we can't see it obviously but blood flow into that into the pelvis is what gets what gets you vaginal lubrication that's just that's coming from the blood flow um as well as clitoral engorgement we know the clitoris you know which we can't see most of it's hidden, um, but you want to get blood flow down there. So you could, the same kinds of things, nitric oxide boosters, there's mixed research on medications like Viagra for women. They, they can certainly help with blood flow. And if the problem you're having is lack of blood flow, then those medications can help. But oftentimes in women, because we're just a little bit more, there's a lot more going on um, with the, the brain, you know, connection. Um, so oftentimes with women, if you're having issues, it, it's it's maybe something else going on. Like whether that's you're, you're mad at your, your partner or you're, uh, you know, you have your to-do list is too long or you're not sleeping well, or, you know, there's all these other things that kind of affect the mental piece for women. Um, mm. But then other thing, you know, other things that women can do is just keeping the pelvic floor strong and keeping those muscles both strong and flexible, which is really important. Um, what, you know, everyone knows about, about doing Kegels, you know, and kind of keeping those muscles strong, especially after you have a baby. Um, but what people don't really talk about much is that um, a lot of women have tight 
um, kind of tight muscles in the pelvic floor instead of loose muscles and they're tight and they're weak, but those people, you don't want to do Kegels. You actually want to do exercises to relax the pelvic floor because that's going to make, keep those muscles, um, more flexible and more able to work properly. So I, I always tell people, you know, women, if you're having any kind of either pelvic pain or sexual dysfunction, or even like lower chronic, lower back pain or hip pain or any pain in those areas, it's worth talking to and seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist and just assessing what's happening with those muscles because the treatment, whether it's they're either tight or loose are complete opposites of each other. And so you don't want to just go down one treatment path on your own because you actually may be making it worse. But if you can get those muscles to be strong and flexible, then that can definitely affect um, your experience and, and pleasure and, or, you know, orgasm and all those things. Mm, that's uh, yeah, interesting. Um you mentioned like the red light therapy. So there's like this, uh, vaginal uh, red light therapy machine or. Yes. Yes. Um, the one I know of is called V fit plus by joy Lux. I don't have an association with them, but it's just basically vaginal red light therapy. It's the same that you'd put on your skin or your hair or your face, um, trying to increase mitochondrial ATP production in the vaginal wall. Um, you can have some improvements in blood flow for sure. And some people have improvements even in like stress urinary incontinence and, uh, you know, like when you pee and you jump, um, and that's probably just related to better blood flow and, and the ability kind of to heal. Um, there's, and these are considered wellness devices. So this is not something that has like huge clinical studies on it, but they're also very safe. So I think it's one of those things that, you know, it may or may not help you, but it's, it's certainly, um, not painful at all. It's kind of, it's like a hot stone massage for your vagina, just pretty good um and it may help mm, gotcha does the, the regular red light therapy doesn't go through the the body or no not it's not going to penetrate that deep even the even the infer the near infrared which is going to be the more deeply deeply penetrating wavelength is only really going to go in depending on who you ask but you know maybe like four or five millimeters um mm. not usually probably even that deep mm, gotcha yeah um so uh, what, let's talk about like some of the more pharmaceutical stuff. So, so like peptides. So that's also like very uh, popular, you know, anti-aging uh, protocol or treatment nowadays. So like, what can you tell us about, uh, you know, some longevity peptides, especially like, you know, like longe like the sexual uh, function or sex hormone uh, side? Yeah. So the most popular one is PT-141. Um, PT-141 is actually now an FDA approved drug in women um, called Valisi or Bremelanotide is the other name for it. But this is a peptide. It's kind of interesting. It works in both men and women, um, but it's currently just approved in women here, but we've been using it, you know, a, a, as a peptide for years for both. But instead of affecting the blood flow, it actually affects your brain. So it basically works by what's called the melanocortin pathway in your brain. It affects dopamine in your brain. And so it, it affects your, your libido, your interest. It also can affect arousal and it can affect um, all the other pathways which come up, come from that, which is going to include orgasm as well. So essentially it can affect all different aspects of the sexual response curve um because it affects the brain so it's if people like it, it some people like it the problem is it can cause it can cause a lot of nausea for some from some people um which is obviously not it's kind of a turn off um but if you don't have nausea uh, then it can be really great and and now there are formulations where you can take it in your nose you can do like it just intranasal versus having to do injections um and you would take it you know 30 minutes or an hour kind of before you want to have sex. And that just kind of gets you in the mood and kind of helps things work a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, what about for men? Like, is there anything uh, or like, is there, is there any like peptide that actually like increases uh, testosterone or something else? Not, I mean, there's, there's, they've looked at things like um, kiss peptin and things like that, but I haven't, I haven't used that one myself. Um, PT-141 works in men too. So that's both men and women. Uh, and then other things like the growth hormone, um, either growth hormone itself or the growth hormone secretagogues, the things that increase your own growth hormone can also really affect sexual function. So that's like your CJC-1295, epimoralin, tesamoralin, like those kind of drugs that are going to increase the signals to, um, to make growth hormone in your body. Uh, those are because they make you feel just better in general and, you know, and also potentially could help with improving blood flow and with, you know, just getting your body healthier, um, then those also can affect sexual function. Mm, gotcha. And uh, do they, uh, do you think like those peptides, all of them, as, as far as I understand, they're like pretty 
uh, mild in like their um so the, 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 I mean, what I'm meaning, like they're, they're not going to work similar to like rapamycin, like which may have like some actual significant like longevity benefits. Um, so these peptides are more like improving like so like your quality of life to a certain extent and maybe correcting some uh, deficiencies or um, like, uh, yeah, like, not deficiencies, but, you know, bringing you back to like some baseline that uh, in terms of like function. You know, I think it depends on the peptide. There's, you know, there's, there's like, tons of peptides out there. A lot of them don't have a, as much research as we would like, which is why they're not FDA approved as drugs yet, or where, you know, wherever you live. Um, so peptides, you know, peptide just means short protein. It just means a protein that's really small. So like insulin is a peptide, for instance. So some peptides eventually go through the large clinical studies and then they get approved and they become drugs and then they get marketed and sold as drugs um, versus other peptides don't do that. So, but they, you know, because they're doing, you know, which we, most of the peptides or many of them at least are, are found in your body. They're based on, on these proteins that are already in your body. That's not true of all of them, but a lot of them. So they're natural peptides that are already in your body that you're, we're giving back to you. Um, like BPC-157, which is, you know, probably one of the, the most famous peptides is used for, to accelerate healing, especially musculoskeletal healing and also uh, gut healing. And that one is normally found in your body in gastric juice. And so they're just essentially just taking that out, you know, making more of it. And then we're putting it back in. Um, so that's an example of a natural peptide. Um, but some peptides certainly I think could be, could have more than just, it could, you know, can I boost you up above normal and then some won't, it kind of depends on what their mechanism of action is like with, um, like with the growth hormone secretors, like the CJC 1295 and ipamorelin and those things, all they're doing is increasing your own growth hormone production. But at some point your body is not going, your body's not going to make too much growth hormone, right? Like it, it has like a sensor and it knows, okay, we've made enough growth hormone um, versus if you take human growth hormone as an actual injection, you can get supra, you know, higher than physiologic um, hormone levels because you're injecting it in your body. So that is the difference. Like you're, you know, whether or not you're making your own body make it or you're taking it exogenously um, is going to affect how high those levels can, can get. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. But uh, I guess like the TRT probably is still more powerful or if that makes sense. Yeah. TRT is, and I think I would compare that to like human growth hormone mm. because we're, you're, we're going to give you as high a doses as we want to give you. And that could be supra physiologic. It could be more than what your body would normally be able to do. Yeah. So I guess like peptides or something that people could start uh, taking much sooner than like hormone replacement therapy. Um, like you could start taking peptides probably if you're, if, if you're, if you're like, you know, you're still, um, you know, functioning very well, you're following the health and lifestyle, et cetera, but you haven't really hit like the, the threshold yet where it starts to decrease rapidly. So you can start to preemptively take it, uh, or is there any like age that is, you know, um, better to take peptides? Yeah. Well, peptides, you know, it's just like anything else. Like you're basically taking it for a specific problem. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're having problems with sleep, then you're, maybe you're taking DSIP. If you're having some, you know, cognitive decline or problems with memory, maybe you're taking cerebral license. Like there's different peptides for different things. And so when you take them would obviously depend on when you would have those symptoms like BP, BPC 157, you know, even young athletes will take that one because mm -hmm. like young, but you know, like college athletes and things, um, because that helps with healing and recovery from work. Workouts, and so you don't have to be, you know, older to take them. So it, I think it just depends on the actual peptide. And, you know, unfortunately there's still a lot of research to be done on a lot of these, like sometimes, you know, a lot of this stuff, maybe there's animal studies and they seem okay, but we don't really know. So I would, you know, you, you use a little caution. Um, I think it is better to work with a provider, uh, you know, a physician or someone who, who has knowledge of these things versus just going out and buying research peptides and injecting you yourself with them as, mm. as, uh, as, as fun as that sounds, you know, they can have side effects like anything else. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. So like you can get them from, uh, like a specific clinic or, uh, what's, what's it like, yeah, like the more legal way of getting them. <laughs> Well, they're becoming harder and harder to get. I mean, certainly there's still some available in the U.S., but a lot of the ones that are out there that pharmacies can't carry anymore. Um, but yeah, there are doctors, at least in the U.S., and I don't know about other countries, but at least here, there are doctors who will prescribe 
certain peptides um, like BPC-157 or um, sermorelin, which is another growth hormone um, secretor, or, you know, some of the ones like that, that are, that are more common can still be prescribed and you can get an actual prescription that you take to a compounding pharmacy and then they send them to you. The benefit of that is that you have that, you know, it's, it's usually mixed up for you. You know exactly what dose to take. Like you have a whole plan, maybe you're cycling it, maybe you're not like, but you're working with a, a provider. Um, the other way to get peptides, uh, which is less ideal, but still commonly done is to just, you know, order them from like a research peptide website where they're marketed for research purposes only. Um, and are, they say on the bottle, you know, not for human consumption, um, but, you know, a lot of humans still consume them. So that's kind of the, the two paths to peptides. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with those websites, you kind of you never know what you're going to get, unfortunately, or yeah, you have to kind of, you're taking a gamble a little bit. Yeah. And it's, you know, you know, I, it's funny. I never thought really that it was that big of a deal. You know, I'm, I'm a risk taker and I'm like from with myself, not with my patient, but with myself. <laughs> um, but I was talking to someone, there's a pep, there's a, um, a protein called um, G, uh, GDF 11, which you've probably heard of before. I don't know. It's a, it, it's not available really mark uh, widespread yet, but it's in the body does all these amazing things that like, you know, it, it's like the fountain of youth kind of thing. And I was talking to a guy who is working with a pharmaceutical to try to bring this to market. And he was saying the problem with like a research peptide for this particular one is if you were to get a research peptide and it had some kind of variation that caused your body to, you know, to mount an immune response against this particular peptide, which could happen, right? Like an, almost like an autoimmune kind of thing. Then you would actually start, you'd start attacking all of the GDF 11 in your body, which would be devastating. Like you don't think about, you know, I think about infections and things like that from all of these vials of peptides, but you don't think about the fact that you could essentially be training your body to attack itself or some other, you know, kind of horrible side effect. So I do think it's worth, you know, when possible, if you're going to do this, go through a doctor, go through a pharmacy that actually has peptides and has tested them and all of those things versus just, you know, kind of ordering them willy nilly. Yeah, for sure. Um, and is there like any, I guess the, yeah, there's no like negative feedback loop or anything. There's no like, you know, the, besides this side effect that you said, uh, the autoimmune response, uh, like there's no there's no like risk of uh, crashing your hormones or something like that. I think it really depends on the peptide. I mean, I, I, they, they do all have, there's, there's risks with all of them. Um, some, you know, some are more than others and some we just don't know for sure because it hasn't, they haven't been studied in large enough groups of people, but they're not, it's not like peptides are safe versus, mm -hmm. you know, versus anything else. Like they're, they're just one more thing that you're putting in your body. And if we imagine that they could have benefits, which we do, then you have to imagine that they could also have side effects. You know, if they don't do anything, then they don't do anything. But if they can cause cause something good to happen, there's always the possible that it could be the opposite. Yeah, right. Uh, and like, what about the stem cells? So like, um, this is something I think, correct me if I'm wrong, this is actually not legal in the US right now, but some clinics has, are still able to do it or how's the situation there? So stem cells um, in the U.S. you can do bone. So you can do autologous stem cells, which means I take your stem cells and I pack, I put them back in your body. So mm. it's autologous. It means it's coming from you. That it, those are allowed, especially like bone marrow derived stem cells. That's you know that's been used for a, a long time. Um, so taking like doing a bone marrow aspiration, taking bone you know hip uh, stuff from your hip bone, and then you we concentrate them. And then you put those stem cells back somewhere else. So whether that's a joint, whether that's you know your scalp to help regrow hair, or your skin to help improve skin texture, or sexual injections, like those are all your own cells. And all we're doing is concentrating them and putting them back in. Um, fat derived stem cells, which is also something that's been done for a long time, which we which we also do. We do both of these things. Fat derived cell cells of, from the same patient had for a while the FDA well the FDA still says that they they aren't a fan of fat derived cells but there was a big legal case um against uh, here in the US against from cell surgical network against the FDA where cell surgical, for the stem cell company actually won and the judge said that those if they're your own from your own body they're your own cells they're not a drug and so you can do it so there's still some debate about that but that that is something that's that's done um, what's, what is not um, allowed by the FDA here is to use someone else's cells and then put them in your body. Right. Um, and they have not approved those yet. Mm, gotcha. Like, is there any safety issues uh, with someone else's cells or? 
Um, you know, the, so the types of stem cells that we're using are called mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs. Um, and these are the cells that are used to make all different types of connective tissue and that, you know, they can become your skin or your muscles or your joints or your cartilage or, you know, that kind of cell line. The other cells that are in your, there, there's several, but the other sort of main group of stem cells in your body are called hematopoietic stem cells. That line of cells is used to make your blood cells. So it's used to make like your, um, your, you know, white blood cells and red blood cells and different cells themselves. So the hematopoietic stem cells, you have to have, the cell has to be matched to the person, which is, you know, so you have to make sure, like I couldn't just give you my hematopoietic stem cells because you would reject it. Like your body would be like, no, you know, and form antibodies and it would be a whole thing. However, with mesenchymal stem cells, they don't have the same cell surface markers that the hematopoietic stem cells have. So, so actually, if you can isolate the cells themselves and get rid of all the other stuff in there, the blood and everything else, then you can give st mesenchymal stem cells from one person to the other, which is why things like um, umbilical cord or placental stem cells are, um, are so popular popular and are being researched so much because, you know, those are healthy babies. The placenta is donated. No, no babies are harmed. <laughs> and the placenta, then there's a bunch of stem cells. They can isolate those cells and then they can give them, you can give them to other people and you get, you got more active stem cells than you do if you're, you know, 40 years old. Um, so that's, that's the reason. So yeah, the short answer is depends on the stem cell, but if it's mesenchymal stem cells, then it doesn't matter um, who you're giving them to for the most part. Mm, gotcha. Any other like uh, wonder drug or <laughs> some other like on the that is currently being used a lot for anti-aging and longevity purposes that we didn't talk about um i think a carbos is another one that i like a lot um mm. it's one of the few drugs in the mouse itp studies that were beneficial for both men and women mice <laughs> you know male and female mice so it extended lifespan in both male and female mice and it's it's an older diabetes drug that is you essentially take it before you eat um, especially if it's a higher carbohydrate meal. And what it does is it prevents the breakdown of more complex carbohydrates into glucose. And so it, it prevents that step from happening in your intestines. And so essentially those, uh, so that's great because it helps to decrease your blood sugar, right? Like you don't have the same spikes as you would. Um, and then it also, what happens is that that sort of starchiness goes all the way through your intestines. And there seems to be some evidence that it's helping, it improves the gut health, like all of your microbials, your microbiome in your intestines get healthier because now they have like all these complex starches to eat. Like they're super happy because they have, have all this good fuel. And so that helps gut health. And so that's actually something very few side effects, except for it can cause like gas. Like when you first start taking it, it can make you kind of gassy, but very safe otherwise, and well tolerated. And when combined with rapamycin, the two of those, the combination was better than either one combined, you know, either one alone. So the rapamycin and carbos is, um, I've, I've taken those for a long time. And I think that that's a, a great combination potentially. Um, that's, that don't need more studies about on it, but it's a carbos is pretty easy to take and get a, you know, it's cheap. It's, it's safe. So. Mm. Are, are you taking rapamycin or. Yes. I've been taking rapamycin probably four years. I'm 47. So I started yeah. taking it, I don't know, somewhere 43 or so. Um, and I just take it once a week or sometimes I'll go every, once every two weeks. It just depends on um, the week, but it's, you know, the low dose once a week or once every two weeks I take. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah. Anything else that, uh, we didn't cover or would you like to talk about? <laughs> um, no, I think that there, I'm sure that you talked a lot about, you know, some of the different supplements. I, I do have a, a new, uh, longevity focused supplement company that we're not available anywhere outside the U S yet, but we will be, it's called hop box. It's human optimization project hop and then box. Um, that's hotbox.life. Eventually. So we essentially have a monthly subscription box that has in it, um, the 19, longevity, I think the 19 sort of best longevity promoting supplement ingredients. So it's things like NAD precursors and spermidine and calcium alpha ketoglutarate and, and quercetin, all the things like that um, in one sort of twice daily pack. So that's out there if you're in the US, um, that's available. And, you know, obviously lots of supplements in that space. I think we'll, I think we'll see more and more in the supplement space in around longevity because it's become kind of a buzzword these days. Um, so yeah. I'm excited to see what else comes out in that space. Nice. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, but yeah, where can people find you and your work? 
So I'm very active on Instagram as Dr. It's a Dr. Amy B. Killen. Um, and then I'm also, I, my website is dramykillen.com and that can help you. You know, I have a bunch of different other websites and clinics and projects and things that I do, but you can kind of navigate to those from my website. Nice. We'll put the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or habit that you uh, wish you adopted sooner? I think that the best thing I've done for myself in the last 10 years is learn to sleep and just like making that a priority. I, you know, I was an ER doctor for 10 years and I didn't sleep for, you know, 15 years because of that. And it, I, when I learned how to sleep and was, and gave myself the ability to get a normal schedule, it, it really changed everything in my life. Mm, yeah. That's, I mean, that's one of the most powerful anti-aging <laughs> longevity kind of strategies. So yeah, yeah really good. I think so. <laughs> well, it was great uh, talking with you and uh, yeah, looking forward to your future work. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's always fun talking to you. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want to support this podcast, then check out our sponsors and leave our review on iTunes or Spotify. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.